Hey friends! In this video I want to talk about some of the open questions that I have about Alexander Technique. I took Michael's course last year and have been finding that material really helpful and also did some in-person training with Peter Nobes in London and that sort of jostled a bunch of recurring open questions that I have and I've been really finding it helpful to track these questions over time and some of the questions I first have have been answered and some of them I still have and I expect that at some point in the future they'll the answers will become clear and I'll maybe even find them obvious but just for now I wanted to sort of uh, timestamp uh, as of today these are the open questions that I have about Alexander Technique or at least some of them. So maybe to start, I'll start with the awareness practice. I think, um, yeah, I've found uh, expanding my awareness to be very helpful, as have many people, and uh, I know how to do that, but uh, still have some questions about it. I think one of them is about like spatial regions. It seems like uh, you can have your awareness expanded, but not evenly, and so I want to start to notice what some of the blind spots are in my expanded awareness. Like, I think sometimes I forget the ground or like this area behind me or other things. And so um, what are those blind spots? How do I notice those blind spots? How do I sort of even things out? Also, how do I see those blind spots in other people? Like Peter and some of the other trainers seem to be able to notice like, oh, you're missing this spot over here or oh, you're missing that spot over there. And I don't think I can quite see that in other people or in myself, so I want to become more attuned to that. Let's see. Um, also, the way that they talk about it, um, your awareness can expand uh, basically infinitely. And so the way that I've really noticed awareness expanding in my own experience, uh, it's like I'm in a room right now, for example, and so if my awareness is expanded, which I imagine it will expand and contract throughout this video, um, like I'll, uh, often it's, it's very associated with what I can actually visually see, um, what's possible to visually see, or it'll be limited to the room. So even though I can't see behind me, I'll like just have this included in my awareness. And then I might have other parts of my nearby vicinity included, but the way Peter talks about it, he would be like, you know, because it was in London, and so he'd be like, oh, you know, include the Thames River or like this other part of London and, oh, you know, even past London. And um, it seems like it should be possible to sort of include that and have your awareness expand even beyond your immediate vicinity or even the town or city that you're in. Um, and I almost wonder alongside that, like what that is or what that means. Let's see how to put this. When I try to expand my awareness past uh, my immediate vicinity or past what I'm, is visually, what I can actually visually see, I have what I would refer to as see-in. This comes from Shinzen Young's basic mindfulness, or now called unified mindfulness, where you have an internal image, basically. And so, um, I don't know, for example, I'm from Massachusetts, and that's where my parents are. And so I can have an internal image of like the town that I grew up in or my parents' house and be like, oh, is that including that in my awareness? Or what does that actually mean? Um, if I conceptually remember that that place exists, is that including it in my awareness? Or is there something else that's being referred to? What exactly is being referred to when Peter or other people talk about expanding their awareness past their immediate vicinity? What is that experience? Uh, am I doing that or not? How do I do it? Uh, to what extent is mental image involved in that or conceptual awareness or just like factually being aware that a place exists? Um, I'm not quite sure. By some definitions of it, I'm already doing it. By others, I'm not. How to do it, I'm not quite clear. So that's something that's an open question for me. Um, another question that's sort of open is just how do I have my awareness expanded more stably? It's definitely pretty stable. I think when I first took the course, it was much more stable because I was excited about it and uh, it was on my mind. And then over time, it's maybe faded a bit. But um, 
it'd be, I don't know, it seems like it should be possible to sort of permanently have your awareness expanded or uh, just to radically diminish how often it's contracted. It seems like that's the work. The way that Peter talks about it, at least, it's, it seems like he's like, oh, you're actively choosing this repeatedly. Um, you just choose it again and again. And if you notice that you haven't, then you choose it again. And um, that seems plausible to me, but um, I guess my own intuitive guesses would be that it would be possible to have it be permanently expanded. Um, that could just be a wrong intuition, but if it is actually possible to do that, I want to find out how to do that. Um, I don't know, and there does seem to be some kind of stability in Peter's own experience or the way that he talks about it, even if it's not permanent or something, uh, where there's some kind of stability there that I don't have. And maybe it's just that it's an active choice and you keep making it and it gets easier and easier to make that choice because you've made it so many times, in which case it's just practice and I should keep doing it. And I mean, I'll do that in any case, but if it is possible to sort of stably, permanently, or at least persistently, or more persistently expand your awareness, then I want to do that. In the short term, I think the answer is just keep practicing. But um, yeah, I'm curious about that. Uh, another question I have is about non-doing. And uh, I'm sure people have asked this question before, and it has obvious uh, you know, sort of problems. But how do I non-do more? I want to non-do more. How do I do that? Um, I think inhibition is really key and practicing inhibition. And so um, that's maybe another related question is how do I practice inhibition more? How do I have more fun doing it? Um, it's no longer quite as like painful or frustrating as it was when I first tried, when it felt more coercive or like I was denying myself something. Um, but I'd like to practice it more in more contexts. And how do I do that? Uh, I think it's pretty easy for me to access non-doing in certain contexts like speaking. Um, and some other contexts sometimes, but I'd like to experience it more frequently in more contexts. So how do I do that? That's definitely an open question that I have. Yeah, I also have questions about aliveness, what aliveness is. I haven't really been satisfied with the different definitions Michael or Peter have given. They seem pretty good, but there seems to be something missing, at least for me. Uh, Partly because of, um, how to put it, how to put this, I mean, I'm not really good at thinking about definitions, but there's some sort of problem where like the definitions given don't include the experience or the experiences include something that I can't describe in words. Yeah, maybe it's that. I mean, to put it pretty concretely, when I experience aliveness and Peter is like, oh yeah, you're alive, or Michael's like, oh yeah, you're alive, or someone else that's an AT trainer is like giving me the feedback, yeah, the aliveness is happening. Or when I notice it for myself, often my body will move more and there'll be kind of a freedom of motion and I'll be more expressive and also be happier and more confident and um, I don't know, more, yeah, more alive. But it, um, and something that they often, you know, Peter pointed this out on the podcast that I did with him. He was like, move your eyes, right? Move your eyes. But the thing is, the aliveness is not the motion and it's not moving your eyes. So you can't just move your body to create aliveness and you can't just move your eyes to make aliveness. And so if you can't cause the aliveness to happen by just like, you know, I, I, I could just decide to permanently always have my body moving persistently for the rest of time unless I'm sleeping or something, but that wouldn't be aliveness, right? You can actually, and I've experienced this, you can actually be 100% still or to the best of your ability, not moving and still be alive. There's a kind of dynamic quality or dancing quality that can happen even in stillness. And so how to do that, right? I talked about that with Michael on the podcast. He was like, yeah, you can do that in sitting meditation or in standing meditation and try that out. Definitely have experienced that. So what is it then? What is that? Um, partly it's the sense of like goodness or freedom to the freedom that I could go do that thing. Um, but then, yeah, the question that comes in there is, is it conceptual or not? And I'm about to seize, excuse me. <coughs> Allergies. Um, any case, uh, is it conceptual? Like, oh, I could pick up this book right now. Excuse me. 
it's not conceptual. It's actually something in the body. It's something in your experience. So what is it? Uh, what is that thing that is not the motion, that is not moving your eyes, that is not an emotional quality? Like, what is that? What is that aliveness thing? Um, I want to have a better understanding of that conceptually, but also more direct access to it, uh, what it is when I am experiencing it and how to experience it more frequently. Um, so that's really another question. It's just how do I experience the aliveness more frequently? The thing that Michael said is sort of notice that you could go do these things. Uh, that was what he first suggested to me on my podcast. That seems like a really helpful exercise, but that seems partly, yeah, again, conceptual, like, oh, I could do this thing. Oh, I could do this thing. And I noticed when I really do get the aliveness going, that there's this embodied quality and how to bring that in. Um, I guess I just kind of want more exercises about how to cultivate aliveness. And I imagine some of that will come in Michael's course and he's working that out. So I'm excited about that. Let's see. I think, uh, Another question that I have is about the way that Alexander Technique people talk about the mind and the body. Peter says, you know, mind, body, spirit, it's all, it's all sort of one thing. The mind is not separate from the body. Um, the way that he talks about his body is really interesting. He, he, I'm paraphrasing my memory here, but it's something like he's not aware of his body or not experiencing his body and it's only if there's like pain signals or other information that he needs that he experiences his body and the way that he talks about body awareness is just like very surprising to me because of my experience with buddhist meditation and other contemplative traditions where body awareness is regarded as um, critical for the contemplative path uh, the way that the buddha talks about body awareness in the sutras is like you could just become completely aware of the body and you would complete the path. Um, so, uh, you know, various cities or powers come about when you're aware of the body uh, and you move along the contemplative path. And also, I think you become better able to help people, um, which is something that I'm excited about. Uh, so kind of how Alexander Technique people talk about the body is really interesting to me and what that experience is and how that relates to, you know, maybe a Buddhist or other contemplative traditions account of that. That's an open question for me. I'm also just not completely clear about or um, aware of what Alexander Technique is that involves the body because Michael chose to focus on the like non-embodied portions for his course because it's online and because Peter, his teacher, sort of focuses on the more like consciousness, awareness type things. It's less focused on the body you know, um, something that other Alexander Technique teachers will have you do is like practice getting in and out of a chair or they'll have you lie down on a table and they'll do various interventions on your body. And there seem to be like at least two, maybe more different sort of lineages of Alexander Technique where some of them focus more on the body and some of them focus more on the awareness and the consciousness stuff. And um, that's probably a bit rough, but that's sort of my sense of it just from experiencing it sort of secondhand, not knowing too much about it myself. Um, and so um, that's an open question for me of like, what is the relationship to the body and what are the people that are focusing primarily on the body doing and what are the interventions there and that sort of thing? Um, how does that relate to the stuff that I'm doing with the awareness or with the consciousness? And um, I'd be curious to learn more about that and see what they're doing and learn some of that myself. Yeah, those are some of my questions about Alexander Technique in itself, but then I'd say my other big question involves its relation to Buddhist practice, Buddhist meditation, and also contemplative practice more generally, and spiritual practice more generally. Um, it's been interesting being involved in Alexander Technique stuff recently because it feels like getting to know a tradition that's like not my own, and it's a different tradition, and they have different language and different values and different way of talking about things. Um, I don't even know that they would talk about it as a tradition, but to me, it, I sort of experience it like, ah, yes, this is a tradition of a spiritual practice of some kind, and they might not conceive of it that way, but that's kind of how I experience it and what I'm in it for. And uh, I wonder how that relates to Buddhism and Buddhist practice and Taoism and some of the other practices and paths that I've been exposed to. Certainly in Buddhism, there's a lot of stuff about awareness and uh, 
expanded awareness and different traditions emphasize that more or less. And um, I think that kind of practice isn't something I haven't have done so much of myself. I know that in some of the Tibetan traditions and other aspects of Buddhist practice that is emphasized also like spontaneity and um, sort of this bounce quality. Some traditions like Zen seem to emphasize that. So there does seem to be quite a bit of, it of, of overlap in terms of what's emphasized and I'm interested in connecting the dots between like, oh, the Buddhists were talking about this and the Alexander Technique people were talking about this and they're related but not the same or they're exactly the same or they're totally different and unrelated. Just really connecting those dots more will be helpful to me because I'm coming from a Buddhist background, but I am interested in diving deeper into the Alexander Technique stuff. I also hope that that exploration will cause some sort of cross-fertilization to happen I know that I found the Alexander Technique stuff super helpful, uh, really opening up a lot of different things that I hadn't experienced myself through Buddhist practice. And, you know, of course I find Buddhist practice really close to my heart and dear. And uh, not only the meditation, but also kind of the worldview and the ethics and things like that. And that's something that I haven't found as much in the Alexander Technique stuff. Although that's also an open question. Is there something about ethics in Alexander Technique? I think Michael mentioned that the way that they talk about use um, is connected to that. So that's something I'm interested in learning more about as well. Anyway, yeah, that sort of dialogue between the different traditions, at least for myself, sort of connecting the dots, but hopefully also in connection with other interested practitioners. I know Michael and I have talked quite a bit about this and are hoping to learn more about it and uh, share what we learned together. So I'm excited about that. And I hope that that dialogue will be of benefit to other people and maybe other people will participate. It's a little tricky because that dialogue is happening you know, for me, if I want to go down that journey, it's like, well, I'm not uh, completely done with the Buddhist path. I haven't practiced in all of the Buddhist traditions. The Buddhist canon and, you know, culture is just enormous and huge. And I don't have familiarity with all of it. My own experience is like very peculiar and particular, a weird combination of influences that's like very particular and unusual. And I don't know much about the other stuff. Um, and then, of course, I'm relatively new to Alexander Technique and just have um, taken Michael's course and met Peter and done like two workshops in London. So I'm by no means an expert in either. I'm just really an amateur that's interested in both of them. Of course, uh, for myself, I'm really interested in my own experience and my own uh, consciousness and expanding that and having more skill and capacity in that. And that will unfold in its own way regardless through these explorations. But I am interested in sharing what I learned with other people and hearing what other people have learned. And so that's an interest that I expect to stick around for some time and uh, we'll see how that unfolds. I, I don't really know what I'll learn or what I'll find, but I hope to share that with other people. And that's definitely a big open question as well. So yeah, I think there are probably some other open questions that I have or things that I don't even know yet that I'm interested in, but that I'll find as I keep going. But as of today, as of this recording, those are some of the open questions that I have about Alexander Technique.